Uh, we're here to inaugurate a new era for small press traffic, a nonprofit that has certainly enjoyed more than nine lives, thanks to Sid for its latest incarnation. And we're celebrating the publication of two books, Max Crandall's The Nancy Reagan Collection, which is a performance novel, and Aaron Sharon's The Blue Absolute, which contains four suites of prose poems. I'm delighted to introduce this fabulous reading. Fabulous, I choose the word carefully. Max somehow combines camp and mourning, a kind of melancholy, fabulous anger, a new mode of expression. I think that it can be found in uh, Derek McCormick's work and the artist Neil and Blake's work and others. And Aaron, of course, is Mr. Fabulous, making confections out of gender, expanding, accreting, leaping, leapfrogging, and generally moving in all directions and inward directions at once. I met Max and first encountered the Nancy Reagan collection when I was purchased by his partner, Diana Cage, in a Belladonna, Belladonna auction and given to Max as a present. What an amazing gift to me. The few hours that I signed up to donate turned into something more. When the book was finished, I blurbed it. And here is that blurb. What is there to say that you haven't not said already? Max Crandall fills the Reagan's famous silence on AIDS with a dazzling fantasia on glamor, grief, testimony, fandom, and ferocious indignation. Crandall refracts the crimes of the 80s through the icons and cultural debris of that era. So many cold-blooded ways for flesh, power, and image to meet in mass death. Global catastrophes ornament Nancy's reign of just saying no as the CIA runs crack to fund the Contras. She floats above a ghoulish death's head, dead and lifelike, the pole star of this performance novel. Nancy induces hallucination at the viral spike. Above all, Nancy Reagan collection explores the meaning of the image in all dimensions, blunt and gorgeously cryptic. The live self blinks behind the one represented. Like Nancy, you will smile one of your political grins. Newspaper clipping, A5, file folder, E, 1 through 10. On March 31st, 1981, John Hinckley Jr. attempts to assassinate Ronald Reagan. Three months later, the New York Times runs an article titled, Rare Cancer, Seen in 41 Homosexuals. Nancy, codename Rainbow, has to fight to be allowed to enter the emergency room where Ronald, codename Rawhide, is fighting for his life. Quote, they don't know how it is with us. He has to know I'm here, end quote. The question on everyone's lips, who knows why the Reagans received the gayest code names in presidential history? In March, 2013, the historic Chelsea leather bar Rawhide closes when rent nearly doubles, $15,000 a month to 27,000. Inside are Herb Ritz posters, Tom of Finland prints, and Michael Jackson on the jukebox singing Smooth Criminal. The riders tumble from their horses like sacks of feed, then shuffle around the beast to square off. Nancy's white glistening eyes meet the rider's dark slit for seeing. She reaches out toward it when suddenly, as she inspects the rider more closely, something checks her, and as quickly all her joy flees, with it her color, the memories, and myths. The rider takes a dozen paces and turns back to face Nancy. By degrees, she is waning. I return to an original thought, that my brains might be exposed to the sun, 
a can of beans cooking in the top of my head. A short spasm rocks through me. I let my head fall back until my neck burns. Then I do it. I look directly into the sun with my hand on an empty holster. In a flash, there are 5,000 Nancys replicating in my eyes, my brain. My stomach turns and dumps itself out. An entire species of acquired charms invade my space. Nancy induces hallucination at the viral spike. She's blazing through my borders. Faced with the assembly of her life, she is forced to release. The writer's head is a gold rush of sunlight. Nancy shades her eyes with a trembling hand, breathing the dust of the border town in through her nose, the pungent stab of glue. Dodge isn't a real place. The settler fantasy Main Street for a Western Colossus is the cover of the High Noon DVD. In her camouflage, Nancy is quickly shrinking. She continues to shrink until she's only visible between the writer's legs. The writer is wearing chaps. The writer is standing in a gay bar in San Francisco in 1988. Smooth Criminal is on the radio. I'm gonna close with this section. It's called Always a Hunted. In between the Nixon gigs that took them around the globe for free, Nancy needed to get things done. Right and left, putting the help in a handbasket and playing a show to the ode. Since meeting Nancy, I'd had the distinct pleasure of landing on the shores of hell, so to speak, where demon people profit from doom. This was a dense area to cover on foot, peering out of the eyes of someone who was supposed to be me. It was urgent to see what I could find in a maze covering names in a feeling of politics. To ascertain my weaponry within this, this series of berserk emergencies. From what I gathered, Nancy needed to move out of a mansion and fast. But where will you go, I ventured, choosing an upbeat TV voice that instantly filled me with regret. Nancy smiled one of her political grins. I'm working on it, but I could really use 2000 to get this realtor out of my hair. Glimmer. I swallowed my own bitter pill, paying suit to Nancy's must fund with generous donation, whereupon I was gifted a spoon with which I began a tactful excavation of Nancy's head. She had opened the door, of course. I'm not rude. I noticed at once that Nancy's hairdo was a dead giveaway, the kind of basket case that really bites the dust when you blow holes on it. By which I mean each follicle, root, and death-defying strand acquainted me in an instant with the euphemisms of power. Although she hadn't yet achieved the hallowed grandma's nest she would perfect in the White House, her bob was getting shorter and shorter by the minute. I thought of a stick of dynamite, the wick burning down. I reawakened, covered head to toe in my own grime, phantoms or pheromones cluttering my head. Nancy explaining the stakes of her persistent world. I've been sick about this contractor for weeks. I've laughed and I've cried, I tell you, but yesterday it dawned on me that the mansion is haunted. I jerked hard at the shoulders, startled by our vocal togetherness. As she slid my stack of green across the table, a wet substance began to bead at her scalp. Was there a crack on the surface of her skull? I began to worry, to worry what fissures foreshadow. Moral bankruptcy? Faith? The ploy is what you make of it. Bless you, child, Nancy oozed. Ronnie and I really value your... Support arrived from distinct corners of the globe pouring in at first through a cascade of homosexual anguish, similar to its root force, preservation. As self-made protective shields expanded around us, we became dimly aware of small villages on the outskirts of us, villages founded in endings and care. Thank you. Aaron and I have been camarados for 40 years or more, and his friendship is precious to me. Robert Duncan's notion of great companions applies. And I am grateful to Aaron for enlarging the scope of what a poem and essay can do, 
as well as italicizing what can transpire at a coffee or a lunch. Aaron has written 14 books that have brought to the page questions of gender, love, history, pleasure, and grief. It is sometimes autobiographical writing that takes in the widest sweep of history, details of domesticity, the politics of form, and the romance of it all. He is a lyric poet even when he is writing prose, and he is certainly a maximalist. Aaron was the first to graduate from the legendary poetics program at New College and was for many years the director of the MFA writing program at the University of San Francisco. He has received a long list of awards and his publications go from Gay Sunshine to the Norton Anthology of Postmodern American Poetry. I want to speak for a moment about Aaron's identification with San Francisco and especially its queer history. San Francisco is alive in these poems. If I am on the street, then I am the street. And later, with no clouds, no smog, no shiver, no shock, every cornice and balustrade, every cedar and pine, even dizzying, every dizzying hill and dune and tower and scalloped beach at the western edge. Reading the blue absolute, I was ready for Aaron's music and language as his engagements, but I was not prepared for the final section, Shiver, which is a hymn to the city as mother and lover and to its, to its loves and inner necessities, its birds and losses and quakes. It is inspired and thrilling language, language that has taken wing. The Memorial. She lay in the grass under cover of silence and that many branched cypress reeking of power. Where she wanted to be squashed as if interred in the stone slabs inscribed with her name as one of the lost. Absorbed into the memorial grove where she lay in the grass. She had seen names she knew. She had known their pain as she could below the grass, beneath the tree. In the silence she shared, as if memory quieted death in the open air. Her cheek to the ground now, feeling the pulse. Was it really just hers? And sensing the underground breath, breathing out, always out. To be part of the death for a while, she thought, as complicit as a ring among rings, and a child of the tree, and the scion of grasses, as the witness and warden of no sound, here with the undivided, the unbroken. It's Memorial Grove, of course. Turning. Or the colors, I tell you, that the leaves pulled from the sky as they fell, if they fell, if falling is flying. As we grasped, gasped, if we gasped, if gasping is breathing. And that gold we both thought, or yellow ignited, or sun strokes fired of leaves bigger than our heads. On the corner where they hung from the trees in drapes as though lit from within. It seemed, or we were, I guess, in the bright drifts as we stomped through and sailed on if sailing is looking and looking. It was three days of crimson rebellion and orange confetti on the wing, while the sky beamed to have shot such high glitter from its great wide smile. Or I did, or you did, as we talked as we walked. If talking is drifting, and walking is melting into the sky's wide smile. The, the poem that starts the book, but I'll read it here now, and it's called The Emissary.
all the sky in that window opens, where he can chase the gulls into that white diffused blue and slurp the pinkish clouds. Then does he look back? Does he remember? Does he travel freely in a circuit, horizon to home, spinning in wild space, but anchored to his walnut desk, his purple shoes, his marble pen? Let it go, he moans, let them go. Could he unblot the page to keep his options wet? Steer for the hills, bank into updrafts over the Sea of Cortez, rise with the wind, harness the air, ride the currents, not look back. I watch him flirt with distances, ripen, open my shirt to the skin so he can breathe me in and calculate the distance home. There's a pot of mushroom soup on the stove, bread thick as a bed and moist with molasses. I see him swerve, soaring back, speeding like a comet, his hair slicked down, crackling crystals on his face. His eyes are dimmer, unfocused, as if just born, but his voice is deep and clear. The window throbs in place, the sky a cipher, a structure of belief. I see the folded paper steaming in his fist. Shall I read one more? Okay. Boy, it's a lot more fun when people are really there, I have to say. Still walking, still walking. Look at the sky, it reeks of projection. Look at my eyes, they're tools of the sky. Look at my face, look at my feet, still walking. Where are you walking? Which, which way are you walking? Ask the birds. What are you singing? A walk along song. How does it go? Bird, dome, pink breeze, mind light in the alphabet trees, and more like that. Look at my smile. It goes up to the right. Is that my sly inflection? A mark of selection? The patch of glory? The angle of erection? All that but rhymier. I watched a man who bought a bouquet. Pleasure made him wiggle as he walked away. He switched unawares. The peonies winked and smiled to the right. What was he singing? A wiggling song. How did it go? Back and forth. Ah, the world's a stage. Look at the page. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, you know, I've used constraints a lot in my work. Um, and in, there were two different ones in this book. The first section had um, began with lines taken from other places, sometimes novels, sometimes nonfiction work, or scattered, scattered things that I found around and wrote down in my notebook. So the poem started with that phrase, which is italicized in the book. And, um, you know, it, it um, in a way, it, it, it's a kind of magic for the poem because it brings, it brings the poem out of, out of um, another language, not the language that's yours. So it leads you into other directions. And the other constraint in the second part of the book was this little group of words, which I've used various things like that before, but this one, because of, um, you know, I think, I don't remember what they were, but it sounds like it was breeze and alphabet those sort of things. But I also love the way it uh, shapes a group of poems, some kind of subliminally, because you don't really hear them, though they're scattered throughout all of the poems, you don't necessarily know it. So it makes, them, makes each poem less random, I think, and less isolated. I love that. I was thinking, I'm glad that came up because it, it felt for me like ball gown was the exact intersection between Aaron and my work. <laughs> um, 
I mean, my, my process, uh, looking back on it, was very informed by the fact that I taught undergraduate writing, like required composition classes for 10 years. And I always taught my students like to think about what do you need to have in an essay, right? Or what's the rationale for why you have this thing? And I think I used those rubrics to make choices um, in this book. And so, and I think the book was really shaped by poets, even though there's maybe not as much poetry in the book. So for, for example, I thought because of how the Reagans were both actors, right? And they acted in not just, but largely Westerns, which then influenced their whole um, fabricated persona and Americana around um, the cowboy kind of aesthetic. So I, I felt all along I needed to write a, a Western and I read a little snippet from that tonight, um, but I didn't want to write it. It felt, you know, I just didn't want to do that. But then I took a workshop with Tisa Bryant a one week, like five day, five day workshop. And I wrote it like almost, it came out just in one, one fell swoop, um, thanks to working with her. So um, there are weird breaks like that, that happened um, thanks to influence and kind of like collaborative thinking. This mix is honestly a sort of first thought, best thought uh, scenario. Uh, Weird and funky, I guess, were the watchwords. And maybe, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, something I would want to hear if, while, you know, seeing a bunch of faces that I'd missed, um, mm. maybe is, is really what was in the back of my mind. Um, but, uh, you know, after those readings, I think there's a whole other playlist that is suggesting itself. Um, so, yeah, uh, maybe there'll be a part, an unbidden part two in the future. Um, but thank you, Max and Aaron, uh, for sharing uh, the work with us. It was really, it was really lovely and lovely to see you all.